All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Uh, there's still a bunch of people trickling in, um, and I expect that might happen a little bit in case folks come late. Um, but we, we do want to get started right away just to make sure we have time. Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, welcome to the Research Engagement and Directed Studies panel. We're so happy to have all of you here today. Um, so first off, I just want to start off with the land acknowledgement. Um, so many of us are gathered on the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, Slayway Tooth, and Musqueam First Nations. Um, my name is Sydney, uh, my pronouns are she, they, and I am right now the Engagement Programming Assistant in the Department of Psych. Um, and I'm joined today by both of my colleagues, Alan and Emily. Um, so yeah, for today we have uh, Dr. Acton and Dr. Brush joining us for the panel uh, for the faculty side, along with research students, Natasha Henson and Bonnie Vu. Um, and I'll have them kind of introduce themselves in a moment here uh, before we head into the panel discussion. Um, so just to start off, let's kind of roll through a couple housekeeping things. So uh, please set your Zoom display name to your full name as shown in your registration. Um, so you won't have to worry about your video or audio. Both of those are turned off. Um, you should be able to chat uh, with Emily who's moderating the event in case um, anything goes wrong or you need help. Um, but please do not uh, use the chat for questions. Um, so actually we're gonna be using Slido for that. So the QR code is here and in the chat right now, I'm just gonna also uh, forward everybody the links to Slido. Um, so you can join via the QR code or via the link. Um, and that's kind of where you can ask your questions. So you can ask questions at any time uh, during the event um, and you can upvote them if there's someone asking a question that you're interested in. Uh, so yeah, please use that at any time. Um, we are also going to upload the panel portion of the event to our website and our YouTube channel, and we'll send out an email to everyone afterwards with that in case you missed the event or would like to review things. Um, but the Q&A will not be recorded, um, unfortunately, so you will need to stay until the end if you have questions that you want to ask and or that you want to hear about. Um, as far as community guidelines go, I just want everyone to make sure that they're being kind and respectful. Um, so yeah, again, if you use the chat function at all, just make sure that you are uh, being respectful. So no profanity, hate speech or bullying, promotions, spam, any of that kind of stuff. Um, so if we have every, anyone who you know is not following those guidelines or who posts something inappropriate in Slido, uh, that content and themselves will just be removed from the session. Um, so hopefully everybody is okay with that. And yeah, uh, without further ado, I think we're gonna run into some introductions here. So I think I'll have Dr. Acknan start, if you can give us a little bit of a run through of what you do at SFU here. Sure, so my name is Lara. I am a faculty member in the social psych area. And I think this is my 10th year here. Tanya and I were hired at the same time. Um, and I study lots of things, but um, I'm primarily interested in what makes what helps people live happier, friendlier, kinder lives. Were there any questions that I missed <laughs> to answer there? <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, I'm sure some of you who are here today are familiar with um, the faculty that we have. Uh, so I'm gonna now pass the mic over to Dr. Brush and you can introduce yourself. Great, can you hear me okay? Yes, you're good. So I'm Tanya Brush, and I'm also, I guess, in my 10th year at SFU, and uh, we'll have to celebrate, Lara. And uh, I'm in the developmental psych, uh, the area of developmental. Um, so I study children, and I study how children grow and develop. So I'm interested in how the adult mind is shaped um, by early experience. And in particular, I study how kids uh, living in various uh, cultural and social contexts um, develop in similar or different ways. Um, in particular, I, I do spend, I have spent a lot of time focusing on parenting and uh, across cultures. And right now for the last 10 years, I've been working primarily um, on Tana Island in Vanuatu. Very cool. Well, thank you guys so much for being here and congratulations on making that 10 year mark. That's really impressive. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Natasha now, who's one of our research students joining us. 
Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Natasha Hansen. Um, I am a student that just finished her last semester in the fall, and I'm going to graduate in the spring. Um, upon graduation, I will have an honors in psych and a minor in counseling and human development. Um, I actually went to Capilano University for my first two years, and then I transferred to SFU. And my main research interests are in developmental and forensic psychology. Awesome, that's great. And Bonnie. Hi, everyone. My name is Bonnie, or Antu. Uh, I am an undergrad student in my fifth year completing my BA in psychology. Uh, I'm also, uh, well, I transferred from Douglas College uh, to SU to complete my BA in, in psychology and also a minor in human development and counseling. Uh, I will be create, uh, graduating this year and I'm also a research assistant uh, in three different labs. My focus for research is on autism and uh, early development. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone so much for those introductions. So, you know, as we can see, we kind of have a variety of backgrounds going on here um, underneath the psych domain. So hopefully there's something that suits you here um, as a participant in this session. So I think we'll roll right into the panel now um, with the first question. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about developing a research interest. And I'd love to hear from the faculty perspective first. Um, so Tanya, um, we often kind of hear that a lot of undergraduates are looking to get into research, but they don't know where to start. Um, they don't know how to develop a research interest themselves. So I'm wondering if you kind of have advice for students or have, you know, just can share about your own journey as a student um, about how to take initiative yourself as a student to develop a specific research interest in psych. Okay, well, that's kind of a tough question. I'm not sure that I would recommend them developing an interest too specifically um, because, yeah, I think what I would recommend is for students to kind of find out what they enjoy doing and what they enjoy reading about um, and go with that broad topic. So if you love, you know, which courses are you enjoying, which material, and you might not enjoy a course and maybe because of the prof or whatever. So don't let me scare you away from developmental psych. Um, but you might sort of be drawn to particular topics within that course. And I think you should maybe look around the department or other departments or whatever, but see who's researching a, that general area. Um, for me as an undergrad, I actually wasn't all that interested in developmental psychology. And I'm sure some of you maybe have heard the story before, but I, I majored in it. Um, and I did my honors, but I did a minor at the last minute in, um, in environmental science because I decided, no, developmental psych isn't really for me. So it wasn't until I really started practicing it and I actually sort of, I, I did an internship in Kenya in East Africa um, with a, an international development agency and th through kind of the university and affiliate of the university. Anyway, point being is that when I got there, um, someone had asked me to do a bit of research with kids. So I started observing children and kind of comparing it to what I had learned in my undergrad in developmental psych. And then I just had more and more questions that weren't, I wasn't finding good. You know, when I came back, I had a lot of questions that weren't, um, I didn't feel like we had enough research to answer them. So then I thought, well, I need to fix this problem. <laughs> I need to start doing some of that research. So it wasn't until I really kind of got more experience and, and then, you know, th there was sort of a light that uh, kind of, you know, was ignited in me. But I, um, yeah, it wasn't, yeah. So just in my courses, you know, I wasn't all that thrilled with developmental psych at, at the time. And now I'm absolutely fascinated by it. So I wouldn't close doors either if, you know, so I would just pick a general area and then, Usually the, you know, the profs will be, you know, have a, have a variety of research projects happening. It's not like we're just doing one thing. Usually we're juggling like 10 or more different projects. And so um, it really depends for my lab. It depends on what the, uh, what the students skills and interests are. You know, I try to get a feel for like, what, what are they good at? What are they interested in? What will help them um, with their future? And then try to figure out where's the match. Right. So, yeah, I, I had a, um, an honor student recently who was interested in adult attachment, adult relationships, and I was doing work with um, young children and attachment. So we kind of just, you know, met in the middle there. Yeah, interesting. That's very interesting. Laura, has that been was that a similar experience for you as you kind of developed your research path or? 
Yes and no. I love Tanya's answer because I don't think I have nearly as interesting of an origin story as that. I never <laughs> traveled to Africa and around the world. And <laughs> uh, but yeah, I similar. I think I think the higher order themes are similar. I um, I started undergrad thinking I wanted to work at the UN and be an international lawyer. Um, and I took Psych 100 as just kind of like one of the many arts classes I thought I would just, you know, use to fill my schedule. And it was just year, year after year, Psych was my favorite area. And then I just started noticing which classes I was gravitating towards. I actually think I, um, in retrospect, probably gleaned a lot of insight from other people around me who had to hear me talk about the classes I was taking <laughs> very often. All my carpool buddies were like, stop it. Like, can we talk about other things? Um, and so I started to notice I was just really interested in this, um, the broadly speaking, social psych content. And I think I was really lucky because I had fantastic um, faculty along the way that really inspired me like they, they were their enthusiasm was very contagious and so in the areas that I was really enthusiastic and excited about um, their their enthusiasm was contagious and I was able to get involved in labs relatively early on um, but yeah I think trying to be aware of you know where where you're focusing your time and your attention and where you're kind of seeing that mirrored back from other people can be really helpful um, and maybe yeah watching where you spend your time where your interest I find a lot of people are you know um, a lot of students in my lab have mentioned that they, they're quite interested in these topics outside of school too. And so it's kind of nice when you can find those parallels. Um, that might not be the case for everyone, but I, I find that's pretty common. And that was my experience too. Interesting. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I'm, I'm wondering from the student perspective. So Bonnie, I'll kind of call on you here. Um, did you find that it was kind of important to narrow down and define your interests a little bit more specifically before you reached out to the labs that you're in? Uh, did you feel like there was a lot of kind of preparatory work of building a knowledge base there that that was important for you? Or was it more of just kind of a fly by the seat of your pants thing? Um, yeah, so I actually started with a like really specific topic, but then it ended up just like narrow me like too much with like the scope that I was looking for so I would say um like identifying some topics that you're interested in, like in class or in your personal life but don't just focus too much on it and I think another important thing I found was not like doing like narrow down or learn more about the prof that you want to uh, to work for or what their research background is and kind of seeing like where you match there. Usually like that will help you um, for identifying like who you potentially can work with. Yeah. Interesting. And Natasha, your research has been pretty targeted in the areas that you've worked in. So anything to add there from your perspective about like where you fit in with a prof who you were hoping to work with in your projects? Yeah, um, my research interests started very broadly too. I found that exposure to volunteering in labs and taking courses that I actually enjoyed and going to office hours and talking with the professors really helped narrow down what I wanted to do and what I wanted to focus on. Um, so yeah, I would say exposure to talking to the professors, taking courses that you like, and then volunteering in labs help narrow down a focus. And then also once you do volunteer in a lab or you do have a good connection with a professor, they also are great to bounce ideas off of, especially if you only have kind of a broad research interest. I know a lot of re our professors do secondary data and sometimes professors will let you do like take on your own research project. Um, so it's always nice to just bounce ideas off of what they're doing and then what you like and just seeing if there is a match um, somehow. Um, but I do think that it is important to, uh, like Bonnie said, to do some research about the professors that you do want to work with. Um, because if, say, you don't do that and your research really do not align well and you end up doing a directed studies or a research engagement course, um, you're stuck in that for the whole semester. And if it's something that you're not interested in, that can lead to a slippery slope of like procrastination, not being super engaged in what you're doing. So I think there is an aspect that you should, um, that it is important to have somewhat of a broad research interest um, and having a good match with your supervisor there. 
Yeah, that's interesting. So as kind of a recap on that, it sounds like for the majority I'm hearing from you guys that, you know, there, there's no need to really just find a grain of sand somewhere that you can, you can kind of play with a lot of different things under the field and that you don't necessarily need to close doors. Um, so for students who are looking to get into this type of um, facet of our department and kind of expose themselves to the research side, um, I think that's encouraging personally that you don't need to put yourself in a box uh, so early on in your education. Um, so I have a couple questions now that we'll roll into kind of just about the process of doing directed studies and research engagement. So I'll hear from you first, Lara. Um, so a lot of times students don't want to overstep their boundary um, or kind of be too demanding of a professor's time who they kind of have a keen interest to work with. Um, so how would you say they could best to go about building rapport and kind of getting their foot in the door with someone that they want to work with? That's a great question. I think um, what has been most successful for me is getting to know students through classes and through office hours is kind of the first point of contact um, because I can, we have a longer time period to kind of get to know one another and discuss ideas. Um, I can also take a look at someone's engagement and participation and, and level of understanding through a class. Um, so that I think is the most obvious perhaps um, a natural way to start a conversation. Um, every once in a while, um, there have been students through honors projects or whatnot who have kind of reached out through other means, uh, often through email. <clears throat> but uh, and those can work out. I'm not saying it's a dead end, but it, someone, um, it, I, I would look for someone to have a clear understanding of what I'm doing and, and what I'm working on and why they want to work in my lab and not just um, any experience. Um, in, like I, I've been on an email where, you know, it's gone to many, many people and someone really wants an experience and I get that. But if, if it's not a well suited um, and, and a good match, um, then it's not really helpful for the student. Um, and so I, I might decline. So yeah, usually getting to know someone through a class they've been taking, they've been taking through office hours, or even just um, forming a relationship through more than a one-off um, email can be a pretty uh, helpful way to nurture that. Yeah, and Tanya, is that pretty similar to your viewpoints on how students kind of build that rapport and engage with you? Yeah, completely. I mean, um, and I also noticed that there was a question about when students should get involved and, and maybe you could kind of tie that in, but I think that students, you know, shouldn't be afraid to contact us, you know, at all, ever, really. Um, but uh, it helps if if you have some sort of experience with them through a class or, you know what I mean, something like that. So go to your office hours, you know, meet your profs, talk to them. Um, and so that's usually a good way to kind of, you know, make it that's usually a good first step. And I think you really shouldn't shy away from doing that, like in your first and second year. You know, usually students like in, you know, I teach um, 250 intro to developmental psychology and, and that's usually where I hope to meet students and then they'll go, usually go on to take um, another more specialized course with me but um, yeah, I, I would hope that students would, would be in my lab for like two years. That would be ideal because then you really get to know them well and, and then you can write them a really strong reference and, and you can make some progress and that second year is usually, um, you know, doing your honors. Um, if it gets to that point, I'm not sure, right? Not for all students, but um, yeah. So as early as like your second year, I would say. Um, so for some students, it's rare, but sometimes I've had first years in my lab, but that, that's rare. It's usually second and third year. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a lot of people um, that I've spoken with feel that they need to start applying for those things and getting involved in that only in their third year and that they have to kind of have quite a bit of understanding under their belt already before they'd even approach. Um, so it's interesting to know that if you're a keen student and, you know, you've kind of demonstrated yourself in your coursework, maybe, and started building that relationship earlier, that there's opportunities to get involved a little earlier than that, um, if, that's, if that's something that you really strongly desire. Um, so, Natasha, I'm hoping to hear from you about what your process specifically was for being onboarded as a directed studies uh, student. So was there kind of like a proposal or a presentation um, that your lab or professor needed? Um, did you need to have any experience beforehand? Um, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, so I had the opportunity to participate in two directed study courses and then also one research engagement course. Um, so for my first directed studies course, um, I, Jer uh, Dr. Jeremy Carpendale was my supervisor. Um, 
before the previous semester, I took two courses with him. So I took um, psych uh, 354, children's thinking, and then psych 450, um, which was social and moral development um, in a seminar type course. Um, I became super interested in um, what was being discussed in the courses. And I went to his office hours and um, we, I ended up actually volunteering in his lab. Um, I think that was actually the startup of his lab too, which was really cool. Um, but I volunteered in his lab prior to, I think for two semesters. And then we talked about doing a directed studies after that. Um, and that's what happened. I ended up doing a directed studies under his supervision. Um, and then for my second directed studies course and the research engagement course, it was a little bit different and kind of backwards than the usual. Um, I did it under Dr. Kevin Douglas, and I first completed my honors thesis under him, and then I completed um, my directed studies course and research engagement um, just to continue on with my uh, thesis because we had some new ideas and we wanted to continue to recruit um, participants and work towards publication. So the first one, um, uh, it was mainly just exposure to the courses and talking to Dr. Carpendale. Um, I did not need any formal proposal or presentation prior, um, but I ended up completing a research proposal at the end of it. Um, and it was really good to have that research experience beforehand um, because I knew what I wanted to do and what I wanted to study. And then for the second one, um, I had the previous uh, research assistant or the like an RA position in my honors with Kevin. So it was good to have that beforehand. Yeah, that's awesome. And Bonnie, has it kind of been similar for you as far as you're involved in a number of labs and have you had to apply to those? Have you kind of just been offered those positions through working with people? Again, your research projects, anything you can offer us there about your process for being onboarded? Yeah, um, so I kind of like, I, I think I'm different a little bit. So I did apply for a research assistant like position and get like into the lab, but it wasn't like that long before I asked them to do like a, a research engagement or direct the study. So I have like not that much research assistant experience prior to taking those courses. Um, and it was really about me just doing like the um, kind of like my own research on the prof, my own like kind of narrowing down the research interest. And then I do like a lot of discussion directly with the prof. So we, we kind of like work together to narrow down what we want to do for the project, but not so much of like, uh, like not that I have like a strong background and then I go into those courses. So I would say on the other hand, like you don't really need to have a prior experience, like research assistant experience. I kind of think that these courses are meant for you to gain these experience. But I, I do encourage you to like do your own research and make sure you take initiative and in, like reaching out, making sure that they know what like who you are and what you're interested in and how this can match their own like interests that would like really help with the process. Yeah, that's interesting. And was anything on your end for the projects that you engaged in were you required to you know, come prepared to your professor with something like a presentation or a proposal ahead of time, anything like that? Yeah, no, not really. So it's it's kind of like I'm just come to them and say, these are the, the topics that I'm interested in and we're talk it out and we kind of work on that formal proposal together rather than me just doing it alone. And I, I do think that it's kind of like better that way for my personal experience because I'm allowed to like, um, explore the the topic that I'm interested in while working with them through the whole process. So no, uh, not no like prior like formal proposal or presentation. Yeah, that's very interesting because um, I definitely heard other things from people who work with different faculty in different labs and at different institutions. Um, because sometimes we have crossover with UBC's labs as well, and some of our students sneak in there and vice versa. And uh, there's definitely been, you know, I think instances where students need have needed to come um, really prepared to make an offer about doing a directed studies or something like that. 
and have needed to, it's the case in my lab that I work in uh, at UBC that people have to prepare a lot of prior material before they engage with um, a faculty member about what they wanna do. Um, and I think that I, I can see kind of the benefits and drawbacks of both sides, but I don't know how much you're kind of necessarily getting out of developing your research question if you're not being that guided in that and kind of do that preparatory work yourself um, ahead of time. Is that something that you guys agree with, disagree with? I think there's a lot of variation in different labs and, and might have to do with the faculty's personality. It may have to do with the type of research that they do. Um, for me, it's almost not feasible to dream up a research engagement or directed studies project with someone even a month or so before a term begins and somehow execute that. Um, the nature of data collection in my lab is often, you know, we, we in social psych, especially, I think we run very large samples, you know, if we're aiming to run 400 participants through a study and someone's trying to analyze those data and write a paper in the span of one semester, that's almost humanly impossible. Um, so to, to dream up an idea, unless you're using pre-existing data, it could be pretty hard. It's not impossible, but that certainly wouldn't be the norm. Um, even, even for honors projects that can span a year, I think that would be pretty challenging. Often in my lab, the um, students who are interested in research engagement and directed studies will kind of, will talk about the projects that are on the horizon for the lab and see what are well suited for their interests and their skills and what they want to develop um, and move from there. Interesting. Uh, yeah. After. yeah. Was somebody else going to say something? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I was going to jump in there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was gonna say, yeah, the typical norm is to like have some sort of relationship with a professor prior to doing a research engagement or directed studies or honors project. And I find it is easier to do that because you do have the expectations of like what their research is and kind of what the goals are. Um, and for me, that was great for uh, my course with Jeremy Carpendale, um, but I will say I was that, student who did not volunteer in Kevin's lab prior to doing my honors project. Um, so I did take his course, um, which was 379 clinical forensic psychology, and we did develop a good relationship. And I would always go to the office hours and bounce ideas off of him, but it did work out in my end um, that I didn't do a um, volunteer in his lab prior to doing the honors project, but I can definitely see how it can be a lot more challenging um, if you don't volunteer prior, but it was good. But then, like I said, we did it kind of backwards anyways from the start. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think I agree with Lara, it varies like by lab, by semester, by, you know, personality or whatever. But I think that um, a lot of labs and profs have like constraints on them, right? So in what they can do. And students do too, because they don't necessarily have the training to help solidify a, an idea. It's actually a really tough process. I mean, even writing a paper, if you're given a lot of freedom, it's really hard to land on a concrete, manageable topic, right? Or project. Um, and so usually if, if a student came to me, if, you know, after taking like my 352, the culture and cognition course, if they came to me and had a specific idea about, you know, using secondary data to answer this question, that would be fantastic. It's never happened. Right. So, um, but it could in theory happen, um, or we could work together to come up. So a lot of the, the research that's been ha happening in my lab, I have had one undergrad go to, to Vanuatu but um, for her honors. But since then, a lot of the research that's been happening in my lab is using secondary data analysis. So we look at videos of kids in different places and try to answer some critical questions in the field from those videos. So if students um, uh, come to me with, with a question, that's great. But usually it happens the way that we've all kind of been discussing here. Usually we're bouncing ideas back and forth. I would present sort of the general project areas that we're working on the topics and then students can kind of, you know, let me know what they're most interested in. And usually it's really clear to the student that they're either interested in how kids learn or whatever or attachment or something. Um, yeah, so that's usually how it happens. Yeah, in my lab. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm wondering about um expectations. So I think I'd like to just tap on that for a bit because um, we apparently have quite a bit of questions stacking up. So we might have to cut the 
panel a little bit short. Um, so I really want to touch on this as well, because um, how it works at SFU anyway, is that you do, you know, sign those papers if you're going to do a research engagement or a directive studies with a faculty member. Um, so from the faculty perspective, I'm wondering, um, Laura, what are some of your expectations for students that you do sign those papers with and that you commit to taking on as a research uh, engagement or directive studies student? Uh, what kind of characteristics in your eyes are leading a student to be successful and that kind of thing? Um, <clears throat> well, there are a few broad characteristics that I think are useful for success in both, but I, I, I see those two positions as a, a little bit different. And I don't know if it's just me or um, a consistency for others too. Um, but broadly speaking, I think curiosity and kindness and responsibility um, good communication, all of those things are pretty essential to whatever you're doing. I think those are probably really good qualities for life, though, so I don't know if they're unique to these two positions. <clears throat> um, yeah, and teamwork. Um, hopefully that that is embedded in there, maybe with the kindness one, a little bit more um, work-oriented kindness. Um, but yeah, my expectation is that I usually work quite closely with students, and so my expectation is that um, Certainly anybody, I, so research engagement, I almost treat as um, a, a more reflective volunteer experience. So the students who are doing research engagement in my lab are people who either were volunteering before or who are very keen to volunteer. Um, we meet in a, in a normal time, not COVID, it's probably much more ongoing, but through COVID, especially when life has been um, quite unpredictable, um, at least at the beginning, in the middle, and the end of the semester, and write this reflective paper, um, which they send to Alan and Emily and myself. And <clears throat> it's been really lovely reading those responses because I can see, you know, not just it's not just helpful for actually writing reference letters later on because I have a very clear documentation of what people worked on and what skills they learned and built. But also the students who have done it in my lab have been very reflective about what it's taught them personally and in terms of their goals and. Um, their life. And, and so it's been really a pleasure to read. Directed studies in my lab, it, I almost think of it as like an honors express or honors light. Um, in my lab, it's very rarely a directed readings class. And most commonly, someone becomes kind of the lead, the project, the senior research assistant on a project who's leading it, kind of championing it, steering it. <clears throat> so kind of overseeing data collection and project runnings, the day to day of it. Um, and then writes a short APA style manuscript on it. And so they're meeting with me weekly um, to discuss relevant readings, giving me updates on the project. And then for the latter half of the semester is working to, you know, in chunks, work toward this APA style paper. Um, and so, you know, hopefully it's, it's someone I get along really well with and we have lots of ideas to talk about and there's a lot of creative discussion. And yeah, there's teamwork because they're managing a whole group of their peers. Um, and I, I actually think those, those soft skills are um, extremely important research and don't get enough, um, uh, don't get the spotlight they deserve. And so I think, yeah, in the end, I feel like, I, yeah, the, the paper matters in the end. I'm always happy to see the end product, but um, students work so hard to writing to, toward crafting that draft and also in managing the project that I feel like most of the time I already know how students are doing way before I even see the final paper because, you know, they've put their blood, sweat, and tears into owning this project along the way. Yeah. Interesting. Tanya, would you kind of echo that or what's your perspective on totally your echo that, but what was the question exactly? <laughs> <laughs> the question is um, about the your, no worries. Your, the question is about your expectations for students that you would, you know, really commit to and, you know, take on as a directed studies or research engagement. Yeah. Okay. That's right. And yeah, so everything that Lara said, and I would just sort of underscore commitment like if we're committing to them, I want them to commit to us and just do what they say that they're going to do and communication and respect. You know what I mean? That's like the ultimate. So I think to succeeding in any, you know, any work environment really. Um, and, and yeah, so if they, if they're communicating well and, and um, then I, yeah, anyway, I don't know. I'm everything that Lara said. <laughs> and honesty. I, I almost take that for granted that like you wouldn't, have to mention that, but obviously there's an expectation that people are doing honest ethical work um, with you. Yeah, for sure. Of course, yeah. I would love to hear from our research students kind of along those similar lines of, you know, in that working relationship once you guys were onboarded and took on your projects, what were some of the kind of 
unforeseen challenges that you faced along the way with that? Uh, Bonnie, you can give us some perspective there. Yeah, so actually for my directed studies project, I started off like um, focusing on one thing, like I was planning to do like a research report where I look at past data, but then I ended up having to change kind of like um, what like my, I, I guess the, re the result or like I had to do a literature review instead because um, like there was like some problems along the way and there's kind of like a requirement of like flexibility there that something might happen, although I, I'm pretty sure like I don't know about other people or other labs, but for my project, I had to kind of like make that switch and making sure that I always like communicate with uh, like the supervisor that was like supervising me and at the same time making sure I put the commitment into what I'm doing and making sure like I'm flexible enough. So that was like one of the challenges like that change was kind of like out of nowhere for me but uh, yeah it was it worked out in the end and it wasn't uh, like it was okay but I think that's one of the challenges during my process. Interesting. How about you, Natasha? Yeah, um, going off of everything that they said, communication is definitely key. I know for me, sometimes I felt bad to email or to ask for additional meetings or um, additional supports, but they, the professors agreed to um become your guys' supervisor. So they're there to help you, to support you, and they're happy to do so. So I would say, don't be afraid to ask your supervisor when you do need help. Um, I know sometimes I was a little bit nervous and that was an unforeseen challenge for me. Um, and then also I would say that research engagement courses and directed study courses are so much more different than just regular lectures. Um, like you have to self-direct yourself, even though you do have a um, supervisor as well, but you are, you have to be very independent at your work and make sure that you are on top of your work. Um, I know sometimes supervisors are super involved in their students' research, but sometimes other supervisors can be more hands-off. And so if you do have a more hands-off professor, it's really important to have um, set deadlines um, and to ask for those meetings because sometimes you can end up at the end of the semester and feel overwhelmed with all the work that you have to do. And I would also suggest um, treat it like a regular lecture, schedule off the two to three hour block per week um, that is dedicated for um, your project. So that way then you don't get behind and you're still on top of all your duties because it is sometimes easier for a directed study course or a research engagement course to not really always be on top of it unless you have those specific deadlines or um, a time block where you have to do that work. Yeah. Can I and, underscore what Natasha oh, said about being, sorry, Bonnie, um, go oh, ahead. I think that oh, was, no, I, sorry. Sorry, uh, I was just uh, want to build up on like, um, like uh, Natasha's last point. There was a lot of like time management, self-management from my end, like making sure I'm meeting all of the deadlines. I mean, not deadlines, but, self deadline, I would say, mm -hmm. to make sure I follow like the whole process. And yeah, just commitment's a huge part for it. Sorry. No, no problem. Sorry, I had a delay. So I, I it, the green box was around your face, but it didn't look like you were talking. So I wasn't sure who it was. Um, I was just gonna underscore, I think the point Natasha made, which is being proactive. Um, I remember when I was in grad school, every time I would go see my supervisor, she had to pull out paper to remember where we left off last time. And I was like, how is this not the only thing that you're thinking about? Like for me, it was my whole world. And, and I'd walk in there and she'd be like, remind me what you're talking about. And now I have become that person. Like yeah. people just start talking about things. I'm like, back up, back up, back up. What are we yeah. talking about? Um, <laughs> So I think being proactive and, you know, it's it's not that the project isn't important. It's just likely that the faculty member is probably juggling between like 20 different projects and trying to make sure that they're on top of it all. And so I think, you know, coming in prepared and making the most of the time together is really great. And and checking in to say like, hey, we've hit this goal that, you know, we said was important. What, what, what can, what should we do next? Or here's what I was thinking we should do next. Can we chat about that? Um, that's really helpful. Um, and obviously it's a fine line. You, you don't wanna be overly pushy and, and take um, unwarranted steps, um, you know, but, but, but finding like that, that right balance where you're kind of active and engaged and, and helping to drive the project forward, but also not taking um, extensive liberties 
you know, like starting a second, you know, a replication project without ethics approval or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's important that students communicate and let us know what they need, like proactively, like, you know what I mean, like show up to a meeting, you know, with a list uh, of things that you want to talk about, let us know in advance what you're going to, you know what I mean, so that we can prepare as well, there might be additional resources that we need for you. So as long as you communicate all of that and are on top of it, then I think it'll go smoothly. Yeah, that's, that's great. Well, I'm going to have to end the panel here because we have a ton of questions for all of you. Um, so we're going to take a little brief intermission for five minutes. So panelists, feel free to turn off your camera and uh, your sound and all that if you'd like to get a drink of water. Um, and we'll be back in five minutes uh, for questions. So thank you, everyone.
All right, we're gonna start back up with questions here in a minute. A lot of you have upvoted a bunch of questions uh, for everyone. So yeah, hopefully we'll get through most of them today. I'm gonna go ahead and share the Slido so that we can all take a look. A little bit of lag here, perfect. Okay, uh, speakers, can you all see? Uh, the questions here on the screen. Oh, SFU Wi Fi at its finest, <laughs> everyone. Doesn't seem to want to pull up for us. Oh, there they are. Okay. So uh, we've got a question at the top here that's got nine votes on it, uh, something folks are really keen to have answered um, about how to make themselves stand out when getting into these opportunities. I applied to quite a few labs with projects I'm really interested in, but having a hard time getting in. Anyone feel free to jump in. Um, I will reiterate a few points from before. Maybe this person has already tried this, but I think um, doing especially well in an instructor's class is a really great way to get noticed. Um, also attending office hours, sending, um, I think face-to-face -face converse, face -face conversations can carry a lot more memory uh, than emails. But if, if that doesn't work out, um, then sending thoughtful emails it can be really helpful. Um, and, and sometimes being prepared is one way to be thoughtful in an email. So um, rather than just saying, and, and sometimes not being remembered for unfortunate things. So sometimes there'll be things on my lab website that people will then email me to ask questions about. Um, so some, doing your homework, I guess, in advance, making sure that you're asking, not asking questions that are already answered, um, doing your homework before reaching out to someone is one way to avoid leaving a bad impression. But to, to have a good impression, I would think do well in someone's class, um, read some of their recent work, think about some interesting and engaging questions, um, try to get into contact with them through office hours, and if, if that's not a possibility through email. Interesting. Tanya, uh, what makes a student uh, stand out in your eyes? Same, similar thing? I would agree. Yeah. Taking the classes, doing well and communicating and, and, and showing up to office hours and, you know, making appointments if need be. Um, but also I think it doesn't hurt to let them know what you're thinking. Like if you are, you know, attending office hours and you're meeting regularly and, you know, you're building a report, doesn't, doesn't hurt to let them know that you're thinking about it and maybe, you know, put it on their radar um, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll get an email like a, a year later, you know what I mean? And then I'm trying to remember that class and I mean, it helps to just kind of, and then also we can kind of walk you through the steps and maybe, you know, give you some tips. Um, it is hard, I think probably for students to just get into labs out of the blue, right? If you just kind of, kind of email somebody out of the blue, I, I, I sometimes that works out and sometimes it's worked out in my lab even, um, where all of a sudden we need, you know, more students in the lab, um, but but it's it's rare. Um, I have actually a, a like an application form on my website where students can apply. They can find out about the different opportunities and apply. And if you look at that, I haven't looked at it in a while, but it does highlight sort of some of the things that are kind of important um, to us. And it's just an opportunity for you to kind of it's an application and it goes straight to my email. And it actually, you can just talk about yourself and your experience and what your interests are. Um, and I find that really helpful. And, you know, if students are in the lab and they see that, then they're probably going to apply through that. Um, and that, that works a little bit better than emailing me, because then that kind of tells me that you haven't really checked the website, right? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, definitely do your homework um, and attend office hours. So you, you have to invest, right? Because like we're going to be investing in you as well. So just invest your time and, and do the work. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm feeling like as a recap to all the, you know, registrants that are here today interested um, that all four panelists are mentioning that, you know, cold calling and kind of stepping out of the arena of the person you want to work with and then trying to step back in might not be in your best interest. It's probably better to strike while the iron is hot while you're developing a relationship there, that kind of stuff, rather than, oh, I took a class with you a couple years ago and kind of started talking to you and then it fell off. So, yeah, kind of keep keep yourself on track there, um, I would say is an important thing that I'm hearing. 
Um, one thing I'm wondering is about this question that um, asks if it's better to take research engagement or directed studies with a lighter course load, or is it manageable to take it with more than two other courses? How did you uh, students feel doing those endeavors? Um, I can I can answer this. Uh, so I think it really depends on like your commitment outside of the school as well. Uh, well, what I did was like I did with other the other two courses that was kind of like also quite heavy. Uh, and I think if you're you have a lot of like life commitments outside of school and you have to juggle like between things, then it might not be the best to do the course because as we mentioned before, like self-management, like making sure you're on track on your own timeline, it's really important. And yeah, you just kind of have to like decide it there because most of the things that you'll be doing is like on your own. You can only like, you you do talk to your supervisor, but you have to take a lot of initiative and be proactive. So yeah. Interesting. Natasha, anything to add there? Yeah, I definitely agree with what Bonnie said. Um, I think it can definitely be done with more of a heavier course load. I think the first time that I took a direct studies course, I took four other courses as well, but that was a lot. And um, so it's really dependent on the student as well and their um, work ethic skills and also about your commitment outside of school and the course load as, as well. Um, the two previous ones, I took the research engagement course and the other directed studies course. Um, they were the only course I took and it was much easier to stay on top of it, to be proactive and um, to get everything that I needed to get done. And just, I felt like, like I benefited um, from those courses a lot more um, when I had a bit more time on my hands for it. Yeah, and just to touch on from my personal experience too, I think sometimes if you're going to take coursework, trying to take courses that are kind of concurrent to what you're looking at, if you're able to, um, in your directed studies was really helpful for me um, doing work in the sleep and circadian rhythms field. Um, I found that just working alongside um, some of the upper level classes there while I was doing the preparatory work for directed studies was really helpful because I was just flooding myself with that knowledge anyway, and it was right at the forefront of what I was doing. Um, so if that's, if that, you know, if you're going to take coursework, uh, that might be one avenue to look at is to stay relatively focused. Um, I don't know if any of you agree with that, um, or if you think that matters, but. Yeah, I mean, I think that that can definitely help, but um, for sure, I think that that, I mean, obviously when there's overlap, it's just going to help you right in school and, and in anything you're doing. Um, I just wanted to mention that though, uh, that for the directed, or at least for the research engagement, and I can't remember what it is for the directed studies, but I always check at the beginning of a semester when we're, we're um, putting in the application that they correspond quite concretely to hours, right? So to work hours. So I think it's like each unit corresponds mm -hmm. to, is it three hours I think so, or whatever? Yeah. So, I mean, I would just ask students to, it's about time management. So take a look at your course load and, you know, look at what you've done in the past and what you were able to manage. And I know that things aren't always predictable, but you could give it a try to see, um, to try to predict what your semester will be like and, and, you know, make sure that you have the balance that you need in your life to stay healthy. Um, and so if, if you think you can manage it, then I would, I would go for it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, shy away from it. Just treat it like another course. Interesting. Yeah, um, I'm seeing a lot of folks asking here as well about uh, when opportunities open up in labs. Um, and I'm, they're asking about optimal times to get in touch with labs for volunteer positions. We do have a, that research fair uh, that we have done in the past, uh, which I think has been helpful. But from your perspective, Tanya, it seems like maybe there's ongoing opportunities and projects. And maybe, Lara, you can piggyback off of that afterwards. Yeah, there's ongoing projects. Our needs cha are changing like every semester. We usually always have, you know, I don't know, on average, like five to 10 undergrads in the lab and some honor students and usually only one honor student at the time and graduate students. It also depends on what the graduate students are working on too. And if they need a hand or the postdocs in the lab, right? So if they need a hand with their video coding and things like that. And students, I should also mention like directed studies and honors in my, in my, anyone who's involved in my lab is also expected to go to the weekly lab meetings, right? So they're getting that too. And that counts as one of their hours. 
Um, and, and we encourage them, this wouldn't count towards your hours, but we encourage them to go to area seminars and things like that. So it really is a good, a good step. Also, if you're hoping to go to grad school or to do an honors or to go to grad school. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. Lara, what about opportunities for you? Um, our, like Tanya, our needs are always changing, but I do think there might be um, generally a sweet spot for hiring in our lab, in my lab, uh, it may, it, and this probably varies from lab to lab. I prob there are probably about 15 volunteers in my lab right now. Um, and usually when people are, for lack of a better term, hired or they join, um, we don't kick them out once they're there. So, um, but usually around the end of the spring semester is when many who are graduating are leaving and new spots open up. And so um, usually the summer, if, if we have a large summer project, we might be doing hiring in April, May, um, but usually the largest intake is, is around in August. In like July, we're getting our ducks in a row for what the fall semester will bring. And then August is usually the biggest onboarding time where we might hire hire five, six new people. Um, but yeah, we, we don't kick people out. And I mean, in a perfect world, I'd be able to take, you know, double the number of people who are in the lab right now, but it's a delicate balance, or at least I think about it, I, I want it to be a very meaningful and connected experience for the folks who are in there. And so if people are waiting for things to do and, and not, especially through, mm -hmm. through COVID, it's not only is research a little bit slower um, and some of the normal studies we run thwarted, um, but also the, the regular means for connection just aren't there. Uh, so, you know, I've tried to be extra careful through COVID, but hopefully the world will open up again and, and whatnot. But anyway, it's a delicate balance. It's not like people are, too, there are a number of fantastic people who apply. And sometimes we only have one position or we don't have any positions because everybody's sticking around. Um, I had one RA in the lab for eight years. She graduated and was working on campus and continued to come. Um, and and stayed you know and remained in in some ways she might she's she's no longer in the lab but she might still be on campus um, so which is lovely and flattering um, but you know people's time and commitments change and stuff so but usually I find for our lab when we when we are hiring um, if it's a big group we'll we'll put it out in the in the announcement through the department and you know we might receive 40 60 applications and we're maybe able to hire like five um, depending on the needs. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to, to, to say that, that that's how it works in my lab. And I assume other labs as well. The summer is really a good time to be applying. And like over the winter break is not so great. We might, we might need one or two students that we hadn't planned for, right? Like over the winter break, we might say, okay, in the spring semester, we're going to, you know, do this extra project or whatever. We might take one or two, but July, August is really um, a good time. Uh, that would be the bulk of the, the shift, I guess. Yeah, that's over. very interesting. And in terms of, you know, selecting your candidates, it sounds like you guys are saying that uh, you often get kind of a wealth of people who, you know, are great candidates. Um, maybe that's not always the case, but um, students are definitely curious about if a high GPA factors into that decision. And the research students, you can reflect on that as well about your experience getting onboarded. We, well, like I said, it's an embarrassment of riches, really, when we try to hire, there's an amazing group of students. I mean, we're so lucky to be at SFU where there's an amazing student body. And then there's this culture where people wanna be involved and, and get into labs, which is really lovely. Um, and the, the downside though, is, is that we don't always have the capacity to be able to give everybody the experience that would be lovely. Um, so usually if we get 40 applications, we, we need to make somehow make a choice. Um, and usually what we do is it's, I mean, it's not like we rank order based on GPA, but we certainly do take GPA into account. For my lab in particular, we'll, we'll often look at how someone did in social psych um, because that is closest to the content and the methods that we will be using. Um, yeah, but, but other classes also are, are helpful. Tanya, is that similar for you? Yeah, um, I would say GPA, like I even have it on the um, on the application there that I do want to know their GPA. But honestly, I, I try not to put a lot of weight onto GPA. And I do look at kind of like, well, what did you get in developmental psych? And what did you get in, in my, my culture and cognition class? I'm just curious, right? So are they understanding the material? Because it is hard to bring you into the lab and to to teach you all of the methods and, and, and to bring you on board and up to speed if you if you didn't get it in those classes. 
So try to try to do well in your class in the classes. And I mean, you know, if you do well in a, in a course, it really reflects your interest as well. Right. So there's usually, you know, a match there. Um, so usually if students aren't doing well in those courses, those that that would um, weigh, he, you know, put, I'd put more weight onto that than uh, than I would a, a low GPA. Interesting. Interesting. And research students was, you know, the pressure to kind of have that GPA really going something that was a factor on your mind when you were applying and that kind of stuff or yeah i think most definitely i think it's always a factor <laughs> on students minds uh when you want to um get more involved in research or if you want to do an honors project or if you do want to get into grad school um but yeah i think definitely it does reflect um your interest level and how much you're willing to commit um to that lab especially with the course that is or the co course that the supervisor um, taught. Um, but yeah, it definitely was a concern, but I think also just building a relationship with the professor too, like is super important. Yeah, yeah, I also think just echoing off of uh, where the GPA versus trans transcript kind of debacle comes into play here about looking at the kind of targeted areas versus if somebody you know, got a C minus in one of their 100 level breadth classes, but they're scoring a, a pluses in all the, you know, developmental or social site classes, then, you know, that might be something that carries a little bit more weight than somebody who has, you know, a lower average in those upper level classes that are really the knowledge base of what you guys do, uh, which makes a lot of sense. I'm seeing a question here that asks about the difference between um, student engagement, which I'm going to assume means research engagement, uh, the course so and directed studies. Um, that information Emily has listed for you guys on the website, but I would be interested in hearing. Um, so Lara, it sounds like in directed studies, um, you were kind of saying that in your lab that kind of functions almost as like a mini honors thing and I'm interested to hear from both faculty about what kinds of things students can do in a directed studies, because it does vary quite a bit depending on who you work with. For me, it's a bit different. Um, I usually treat directed studies as a way to sort of introduce a student to the topic of their, um, I was gonna say dissertation, <laughs> of their honors project, um, which eventually will become a dissertation, hopefully. Um, but I, uh, yeah, so I use it as a, as a way to sort of start talking and reading with the students. So, and we meet every week, um, every week or every two weeks, every two weeks usually for directed studies. Um, so I kind of prepare a syllabus that will help me. So it's usually about, you know, students and I usually come up with an idea or there's a, you know, an idea all ready for them, whatever the case may be, it's different depending on the student. And then what we do is uh, put together a reading list. I put it together with the student. Um, it's stuff that I wanna read, the student wants to read, or I wanna read again. Um, and it's all directly relevant to um, the project that they're working on um, in the lab for their honors that they intend to work on. So that kind of helps us all prepare because yeah, it helps kind of bring the student up to speed and me too, because usually we're doing kind of a new idea. Um, and so, and it helps with the writing and, and to see if we've missed anything in the literature. Um, so that's usually how what I do with the directed studies and usually that happens either in the spring semester or in the in the summer. Um, and so students are contacting me kind of well in advance usually you know I wouldn't I wouldn't have a student just do a directed studies like now like that that's all planned out well in advance so you want to be contacting people early. Yeah. Um, yeah so if I if I was planning a direct studies in the summer it's probably somebody who's been in my lab all all year. Exactly. Yeah. So, and then maybe like the end product of a directed studies would be somewhere along the lines of like an in-depth literature review, that kind of thing. Definitely. Yeah. Interesting. So they write a paper at the end. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Lara, for you, is there any um, data collection or anything like that that's involved in the directed studies you do? Yes, most of them do involve data collection. Um, it's not like the person who's doing the directed studies is solely responsible for the project's data collection in entirety, um, but uh, usually they become the project one of or the project lead. So if it's a project that is um, at some point overseen by a graduate student, they might become kind of the, the lead research assistant, the senior research assistant on the project, um, not only assist with data collection, but help oversee and coordinate, you know, 
um, it might be printing more materials, it might be making sure that we'll, we're, we're well stocked on whatever we need for participant reimbursement. It might mean posting time slots and help coordinating schedules across other people so they get a little bit more of the management perspective um, of the study too. Um, in addition to you know, meeting weekly and, and working towards a paper. Interesting, interesting. Um, I'm wondering if students can reflect on this question here, uh, our research students, um, about requiring a CV. Um, for anything that you applied to, was a CV required? And if you didn't have any prior research experience to put on there, uh, what were some things that kind of helped you out in that regard? This was actually my struggle when I first tried to like apply to lab, uh, but I found that putting your so there are sections where you can put your prior courses that are relevant to the lab you're applying and kind of like the overview from what you learned from that course that might be relevant to your like applying for your application to that lab. And also I added like services. So things that you do like volunteering outside the course, even like work experience. Um, I really try to like kind of like reflect back on my experience outside inside school and just show it there even though you don't have like direct research experience I would say those things are the things that like um, the supervisor can see that you've already had some kind of like experience there. Interesting. Natasha anything to add there? Yeah I agree with what Bonnie said too. Whenever I would go to a lab website or something and they had CV I would get super intimidated especially when I didn't have any research experience prior, but it, they also do look at um, like leadership roles, like your work experience, um, professional development and certifications or distinctions, or if you've tutored. So they, even though you don't have any research experiences, there's a lot of other factors that they will look at um, and consider. And I think sometimes not having a CV or not having the research engagement is intimidating and makes you not really want to apply, um, but everyone starts somewhere. And so you shouldn't be too in intimidated um, to apply if you don't have the research experience because everyone starts somewhere and this is how you gain the experience. Yeah, and faculty, I, would you guys, oh, sorry, Bonnie, were you gonna cut in there? Sorry, yeah, I was gonna ask, uh, I mean, I was gonna add that this is where like building the relationship with the professor is really important because they know who you are, they know you personally. So maybe like not having those prior experience, it will, wouldn't matter as much if you already kind of like build that um, relationship there, I would say. Yeah, interesting. And from faculty, are volunteer experiences something that carry weight uh, for you guys when you're looking at applications? Are there specific things that you look for in volunteering, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, you're actually raising a good point it makes me want to remove CV on here because, you know, if we want students in their first and second year or second, you know, year to be applying, right, that if I wouldn't want to intimidate anyone, I see it as sort of an opportunity to share a little bit about who you are, right? Um, um, yeah, so hopefully it's not sort of deterring students from applying. Um, in terms of like volunteer experience, Sometimes if I see that a student is in multiple labs, I, you know, I kind of question that, I like I question it, not, not in a questioning their decisions, but I just say, well, hey, do you really need another lab? Because <laughs> there's lots of students who are really dying to get into labs. So, you know, and, and maybe they, they don't really need that extra experience. So I usually question and ask why they're hoping to get, you know, more experience. Is it that they want to switch fields or you know, what's happening there. So I do look at that with volunteer experience in terms of like, if, if I found out through looking at a CV, if I found that there's somebody who has traveled and who has worked with kids, that's a bonus. Um, if they have interest in children, right? Um, yeah, so if, if I see any of those things, that'll be a bonus. But if they never submitted a CV, I wouldn't even notice either. That's fine. Exactly. Laura, same for you. I don't think we... I don't think we put too much emphasis on previous volunteer experience. I mean, if someone were applying to grad school to work with me and had never volunteered, that would be a, a larger concern. Um, but I think there's an understanding that you've got to start somewhere. And thankfully, the lab is kind of this big, pretty supportive place where, you know, even if you're just joining there, it's pretty quick to learn the ropes. And so, I, I mean, previous experiences, I don't think it's a handicap. I think if someone is trying to juggle five labs at a time, that would probably be pretty difficult. Um, but I don't think it's a 
it, it might be an advantage, but it's certainly not a prerequisite. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, unfortunately, we are out of time to get to the rest of the questions here. I'd like to thank everyone who submitted these great questions and thank all of you panelists um, for answering them. I think we've got really a great knowledge base um, that we've really you know, uh, covered here. Um, so yeah, I, I want to just, yeah, thank everyone for coming today. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing now and put the final slide up here. Um, so the last question that I'd like to pose just to the panelists before we wrap up is faculty, are you recruiting right now for your labs? Not at the moment, maybe come summer. Okay. Same. Yeah, totally, completely the same, same position. <laughs> okay, interesting. Okay, so students keep your eyes peeled for opportunities in summer if you have interest with working with either of these uh, lovely faculty members. Um, Dr. Villion's lab is recruiting right now. So if you have a forensic interest at all, uh, an adolescent forensic interest, um, please do submit an application there. Take a look at your opportunity bulletin. Um, and other than that, thank you so much to our panelists um, for joining us today. It was really lovely to have all of you. And yeah, if everyone can fill out their uh, post-event survey, we'll be emailing you a link to that. Um, that'll contain the recording for the YouTube as well, if you'd like to take a look um, at that and keep reviewing the material. And other than that, um, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. And thank you so much. Thanks for organizing. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.